Oh, good morning. You caught me raiding my refrigerator. Yes, today is Tuesday, March the 2nd. And today we are at the topic of discussion, uh, if you haven't already put it together, from the two YouTube videos that we watched. Is imperialism in East Asia. East Asia, of course, meaning China, Japan, the Philippines, American imperialism, uh, and things of that nature. And so, with that, let us begin, shall we? Uh, I don't know if you noticed or not, but, we we'll begin here at Roman 15, but uh, yours truly has combined two chapters on imperialism to make one long unit. And yes, I know it is long, but uh, we're going to get through it. Yes. Pardon me. So, the United States, yes, the United States of America, good old U.S. of A., country that never does anything wrong. Uh, yeah, I know, my liberal colors are showing. Also got on the in, in on the Imperialist Parade, largely through the Spanish-American War, uh, which, the Spanish-American War, uh, next year you'll learn about that in American history. 1898, and that was it. The Spanish-American War lasted all of six months. I mean, uh, the Spanish-American War, yes, it was an act of imperialism. Basically, um, the United States uh, saw a weaker country in Spain, decided that weaker country couldn't take care of its own toys, and beat that country up, and then took the toys away from it. And that's it. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. There's no other way around that. So let's begin, shall we? Um, through the Spanish-American War, but also ambitious citizens, especially business interests, who wanted to make money overseas from the riches of the undeveloped world. Places like Cuba, places like Cuban sugar, Hawaii, um, the Philippines, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The United States won the SA, that means Spanish American. Spanish American War. Won the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam in 1898. The USS Maine. Interesting story. The US, uh, you see, the United States uh, was upset over uh, the way the Spanish were controlling Cuba. Cuba, you know Cuba. Cuba, that little island that's literally 90 miles south of Florida. I mean, it is 90 miles. But in 1898, the United States was heavily dependent upon Cuban sugar. Uh, and a lot of American businessmen had invested heavily in Cuban sugar. They owned plantations or at least had contracts. Well, a lot of the Cubans who lived there didn't really want to be ruled by the Spanish anymore and were trying to kick the Spanish out, aka they were revolting. And in the course of those revolts, they would, oh, I don't know, destroy property, uh, burn sugar plantations, burn American installations, cause the United States to lose money. And so, because of that, um, you know, the uh, Amer good-hearted American businessmen said, "We've got to help these pure, these poor Cubans find independence." Uh, actually, they basically told Spain to either control Cuba or we'd control it for them. And to show that we meant business, the United States sent one of its battleships, USS Maine, which parked itself right in the middle of Havana Harbor in Cuba. And one night, the main blew up, just blew totally up. Uh, I think that something in the neighborhood of 400 American sailors died in that explosion. Well, immediately, the United States blamed Spain for that, which couldn't, you know, anybody with a uh, brain in the head would know the Spanish didn't do it. I mean, the last thing Spain wanted to do was to go to war with the United States in their own backyard. 
Uh, <clears throat> and so what happened? I mean, who blew it up? Well, to be honest, I mean, it's kind of a subject of speculation. The most likely culprit would be those Philippine, I'm sorry, the Cubans who wanted independence. You see, the Cubans couldn't kick the Spanish out on their own. Um, but they knew that the United States could. And so if they could somehow provoke the United States to go to all Spain, they might get that independence they wanted after all. Uh, another culprit might have been that the ship just, you know, steam-driven uh, battleships, steam-driven ships had a habit of blowing up. You know, they have their power by hot water, uh, hot steam. And oftentimes, <clears throat> when the boiler has an explosion, it tears the, you know, it's a very violent explosion. Well, anyway. So the United States, President McKinley said the United States had a responsibility to educate the Filipinos and uplift and Christ, uh, Christianize them. Yeah, nothing more, uh, nothing more racist than that. Well, actually there is, but it was a racist statement. Emilio Aguinaldo, Emilio Aguinaldo was a Filipino freedom fighter who was trying at first to kick the Spanish out and then spent the next six years after the United States came and kicked the Spanish out. Uh, Aguinaldo fought against the Americans. How did the U.S. treat the Filipinos? Eh, uh, you know, probably better than the Spanish. But still they didn't get them independence. As it says there, they didn't get them independence. Did they explore, exploit the Philippines for personal ga business gain? Yeah, not only personal business gain, but they also built a giant naval base in the Philippines, Subic Bay. It was an American naval base for you know, decades. Um, the U.S. also gained the Hawaiian Islands. What crop created an interest in the Hawaiian Islands? Pineapple. Yes. There was a time when the people of the United States thought that um, pineapple would be the primary source of sugar. Um, you know, you, because pineapples are so sweet and you can try it. Uh, anyway, how did the McKinley Tariff Act of 1890 affect the business of the Hawaiian Islands? Uh, well, basically, uh, it vested lots and lots of interest and money into those Hawaiian Islands, which had been independent. Annexation, well, that's what the United States did. They annexed the Hawaiians for their own protection. I mean, the, I mean, there's no other way to say it. The United States basically just took over the Hawaiian Islands because they said, well, we need them, so there, we're taking them. Uh, who was Queen Lelukalani? She uh, was the queen of an independent Hawaii. She lost her throne. She was usurped. And the ruler of the Hawaiian Republic became, yes, the United States, a senator, wait for it, Dole, as in Dole Pineapple. In 1898, Hawaii was annexed by the United States. Now, look at this. You see this? This is from that uh, exercise that you've already done. And if you haven't done it, the matching section, you might want to give me a, a buzz, give me an email, and let me know. All right. So, I mean, you see all these territories here. Uh, they might pop up again on your next test. Now, notice we begin with Chapter 28. Since Chapter 28 technically concerns the same subject material, which is imperialism, only this time the imperialism focuses on China, Japan, and Latin America. Remember that China as a people, and, uh, you know, we haven't even talked about China, but this is world sin, we should. Uh, China is probably the oldest civilization on earth. But when the Europeans first started showing up in China for trade, the Chinese decided very quickly they didn't like them. And you know what? For good reason. Um, the Europeans smelled. I mean, they did. I mean, Europeans just weren't into that whole bathing thing. Not lying. And uh, the other thing was that Europeans were aggressive and they were rude. Uh, and, you know, you think, oh, rude, what does that mean? Well, I mean, they were. I mean, for example, for example, and this is a small tip of a giant iceberg, cultural differences. 
For example, in Chinese and most Eastern cultures, when someone asks you for something, it is considered uncivilized and impolite for you to just say, no, you can't have that. And uh, the Chinese would respond. If you don't, you say, well, why do they do that? If you don't want to give somebody something, they ask for something, what do you do? Well, you simply say nothing. Or you don't respond. Or you change the subject. And a cultured person would know that, hmm, then that person doesn't want to do this for me. Well, Westerners aren't like that. Westerners, uh, if you ask someone for something and they don't respond to you, Westerners ask again, only they're louder. It's kind of obnoxious, actually. Um, and if they still don't respond, they ask even louder. And finally, Westerners, if you, if you ask someone for something, they don't respond. To be honest, they just take it. And, of course, you can see where that would cause problems. Uh, so, remember also that the uh, China, that China as a people, a government, and a nation believe that they were culturally superior to all nations. And one of those videos I saw uh, said where the Chinese said, we already have everything we want. We don't need anything from Western barbarians. And they believe that their civilization, their culture, was the highest form of mankind here on Earth. And that included these Westerners. And who, by the way, the Westerners, though, had advanced technically far beyond the Chinese. Remember, the Chinese were also influenced by Confucianism. Interesting thing, Confucianism. Now, Confucianism is not a religion. Confucianism is more of a philosophy. And Confucianism basically references the way things were done in the past reverences ancestors and rejects modernism and technology. You see, that really hamstrung though the Chinese as far as competing in a world that was increasingly modern and increasingly aggressive uh, and the Chinese were getting left. In a letter to King George III of England, the King, the uh, King, uh, Queen Emperor Manchu, Emperor of China, said the Chinese did not need the strange objects of barbarians. Yeah. <clears throat> China had become self-sufficient from a food perspective with quick-growing rice and maize, corn, sweet potatoes, and peanuts. China also had extensive mining and manufacturing industries. Ah, yes, the Opium Wars. Now, that film should have explained that. But basically, the Opium Wars, and there were two of them, uh, were caused by the fact that the British were making money off every country in the world, except China, uh, for two reasons. One, the Chinese grew this tea that the British just loved. I mean, you know, it's, it's hard for us to fathom now with all the things that we have to drink, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic, but uh, the British could not get enough of Chinese tea, so much so that the British uh, trade imbalance, in other words, the British bought more from the Chinese, and that was the other half of the problem, the Chinese bought nothing from the British. It was a trade imbalance, and the British were losing money in China. And so the British said, hmm, we have to find some product that the Chinese will want, or rather need. That product, and remember we had our long discussion about opium and opiates and Oxycontin, well, the British said, hmm, what product can we sell the Chinese that they would really want once they started taking it? Answer, opium. Yes, just like the biggest drug, in fact, the British, the British were the biggest drug dealers ever to live on this planet. They sold opium to the Chinese, particularly the young people. And basically by taking, as it says there, by 1835, as many as 12 million Chinese people were addicted to smoking opium. They called it riding the dragon. 
Yeah, I mean, and I talked to you about opium before, you know. Um, I had I have to say that I mean, you know, uh, opium is a very good painkiller, but it is very dangerous. I mean, for two reasons. Number one, obviously, it's physically addictive. Number two, um, the first time that a person and you know, addicts will tell you this: first time you use an opiate, uh, it gives you a sense of euphoria. That's called riding the dragon. Then, after that, you try to regain that sense. The problem is you never do. That's called chasing the dragon. Uh, you never do regain that sense, uh, that same sense of euphoria, of goodness, of feeling good. And uh, that's called chasing the dragon. Twelve million Chinese people were addicted. All they wanted to do was lay in opium dens and smoke opium young people and to pay for that opium they began to steal why do the chinese fare poorly in this war should be wars well well the chinese were uh, equipped with the best weapons you could make out of bamboo and of course the british had the best navy in the world and guns that exploded so, two wars. Once again, in 1842, the British signed a peace treaty, the Treaty of Nanking. In it, the British gained the port colony of Hong Kong. Yes, Hong Kong. Uh, a, a very, very good deep water port on the southern coast of China that the British held... Mm -hmm. 1997. Yes. I mean, it was part of the British Empire. Today, Hong Kong is part of China again. But Hong Kong, since it was part of the British Empire for so long, is having real problems, and the Chinese have real problems because the people of Hong Kong are, you know, the Chinese are clamping down using Chinese style communism. Well, people of Hong Kong are not good with that. In 1844, the United States and other foreign citizens gained extraterritoriality. What does that mean? It's kind of a it's a very uh, difficult concept. And yes, that is extraterritoriality. All right. The Chinese had also had internal problems. The population of China had grown to 430 million, and while food production did not increase, rebellions also began to increase in the. I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> The Qing Dynasty, a better, an easier thing to pronounce than the Qing, is the Chu Dynasty. I'm going to sneeze again. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, the Taiping Rebellion was started by Huang Zhivan. Uh, who promised a heavenly kingdom of great peace where hunger and poverty 
would be banished. He raised a million peasant army and was able to control part of China with the capital of Nanjing. Uh, the leaders of his government constantly feuded with the king, and foreign armies constantly fought against them. Uh, the Taiping government failed in 1964, but at a cost of 20 million Chinese deaths. As the Westerners grew uh, more and more influence on China, the debate grew about how to deal with them. Some in China wanted to modernize China and become like the West. Uh, we're going to pause here. I'm going to get rid of this. And we're back. Thank you very much. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Uh, some Chinese wanted to modernize China and become like the West. Others wanted to stay loyal to the old ways. I mean, Confucianism was very strong and to throw out the Western devils. Okay, we're going to start talking about the, uh, uh, the Boxer Rebellion tomorrow, shall we? Okay, and so with that, um, we'll end it for today.